Welcome to the Nerds with Friends episode 11 podcast. We have here uh, scholars and gentlemen and men of culture. We have Will Shaw, fantastic artist. We have Caleb Whittle, entrepreneur, and Carrie Duvall, astute writer and also artist who's been putting out some great work lately. So uh, happy to have you all on the Nerds and Friends podcast here. And today, Carrie brought in that we're going to talk about world building, right, is our topic. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about um, world building and the different mediums that we all work in and we like to work in. And I think it's going to be interesting because we all have completely different backgrounds of, uh, you know, genres that we like, where our world, world building comes from, and what our different methods are. And we've all, um, outside of, unfortunately, I haven't gotten to world build much with Caleb, uh, I think we've all been able to ping off each other in some way, shape, or form for these different ways of of uh, making the worlds that we like to write and play in in RPGs and, and, and the like. I agree completely. I'm excited to delve into this. Real Absolutely. quick before we do, though, uh, I wanted to say that we uh, shared with Will and Carrie uh, the 719 Cruise music video, Dicks, today. Oh, no. And, uh, <laughs> it was their first time seeing it. I loved Carrie's observation. He was like, Caleb looks exactly the same <laughs> in that video as he does yeah. now. <laughs> I don't K- know if that's Caleb, a good thing or not. <laughs> well, Caleb, you you've you've aged in like the the way that they did that season of Friends where they kept flashing back to the 80s, where it's like, check out the hairstyle and different beard, but like everybody but like but like Chandler still looks 40. Like it's <laughs> very it's very particular. Yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, the only difference is it looks like you shaved for the music video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I rocked the uh, goatee back then. Oh, yeah. Good times. <laughs> if anyone's Absolutely viewing this, uh, definitely do not search the 719 crew dicks on YouTube video. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> It's it's uh it's very sad that uh, that three o three got picked up to to tour with Snoop Dogg when the seven one nine crew got um got right. uh, the blow off. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's okay. We uh, Caleb and, did a did a song with uh, a collaborator of Hobson, who's a really talented uh, really talented rapper. Yeah, I, I won second place in myself. That it <laughs> took me this long to realize what seven one nine was a reference to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we weren't that original in the naming of our rap group at all. Um, yeah, I, I won second we place one. in that in that contest, Josh. That's awesome. Yeah. That was, that was I, like your best song. You killed it on that. I, I don't know how that happened, um, but it did. And I will always carry it as a badge of honor internally that I never share. <laughs> raw, raw musical <laughs> talent. Yes. <laughs> love it so world building um let's dive into that um there's so many ways you can build worlds be it writing talking to your cat um <laughs> perfect time. um dungeons and dragons role-playing games even artwork even music for caleb caleb makes music um there's so many ways to world build and share your creativity with audiences let's jump in will what is your what are some of your top things with world building with your art and with RPGs that you like to do? Yeah, usually the big thing that I always go for, um, and some of you more, know this more than others, is like I'm a huge mythology buff. And so I try to find like a point of cultural reference for uh, whatever I'm going to be designing for, like what kind of like background I want to reference, what kind of mood this is going for. And also any type of like uh, specific like region that I I want going into this character um, to just try to pull from whatever source kind of fits what I want for like the attitude or the vibe to end up being. That's fascinating. How, how long have you been into mythology? Has it been like kind of just since you were young and you've just been collecting all this knowledge that you can pull from? Oh yeah, since I was like the my first venture into mythologies are those like uh like 40% true like 
DK books that uh, the school libraries had. Mm -hmm. I remember being like three or four and getting the book on uh, Egyptian uh, mythology and just diving into that, which I don't recall anything that's actually true from that book. <laughs> Uh, but that kind of just started me on the path of of researching to different mythologies, and then I got into like Greek and Norse, uh, because I'm in America, and uh, that those are the two that are most readily available. And then as I got older, I started getting into more diverse uh, mythologies, like uh, reading what's available of the the. Oh, are you guys there? Find the differences between like uh, Hellenistic. Oh. Can you guys hear me? From Eastern religions. It's just something that I've always found fascinating. Well, and if I can cut in on good, the, oh, here we go, Josh. Josh Lindquist is the host again. Okay, so recording is back in progress. Okay, we're good. Yes. I don't know what happened, but we will see what that does to the video. Okay. It's, it's going to uh, clip it, out. so good luck on your editing. Because I better learn how to do it now. I have, yeah. I have, a, I have Adobe uh, Premiere. I'll, I'll figure something out. There you go. You know, good, good. I, I just got Photoshop and Will was showing me how to use that last night. But speaking of Photoshop, um, so Will does Inktober every year, which for those of you that are uninitiated to the artist side of TikTok is it's like a 30 day, 30 prompts. And the theme kind of depends on uh, whatever you're into. And I've seen I've seen Will do creatures and myth before with different uh flows or different like themes and uh the one i the one i remember is from a couple of years ago where you said that it was it was all mythological creatures but they all like you wanted to make them all like cute and cuddly somehow oh, like yeah. uh and yeah. i i loved how that went down uh, like little almost chibi-ish uh <laughs> like and i drew them all on like uh three or four inch squares so they're not a whole lot of detail, but I, that was, that was a bunch of fun just trying to figure out uh, what I could do. Cause I was also, uh, there's always a prompt list with Inktober. And so just trying to find like uh, some sort of like mythical creature or cryptid or urban legend that just kind of fit with the theme and then just try to make a little like cute version. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always fascinating to figure out like where that stuff comes from and to, uh... And to like pick a theme and to make everything kind of unified seems like a really cool way of doing that. Yeah, it's less of a it's more putting like a restriction uh, on myself to try to narrow down what I can do, because a lot of times, especially with uh, with Inktober, there's not a whole lot of prompts, so you can kind of do whatever. And so just adding a few restrictions kind of narrows down the field of what you can work with um, and just kind of gives you a little bit of, of uh, I guess, a place to work from where suddenly there's not infinite options. There's only so many different things that you can pull from that are going to fit all of the criterias, whether they're arbitrary or not. Which I think really does help with uh, from the storytelling angle as well. Like um, we were when I was uh, I was actually joining one of uh, your campaigns, Carrie, when uh, I decided to make this backstory for my character. And I knew I had a few different restrictions based on what was already going on in the world. And I knew like class that I wanted. I knew the character. I knew kind of the vibe. And so that just kind of narrowed down where I could start with. And then that just gives you kind of a nice foundation that you can build off of. Yeah, and, and the cool thing about that um, was you you decided to make a drow death cleric uh, that worshiped mm -hmm. Aron, the, the Welsh deity. And 
you brought in this knowledge of the mythology that we use to not actually not only expand um like like you 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 had a city in mind and a concept and you sent me these really excellent breakdowns of like here's how the city would be broken down and what the districts are and the cool thing about that was uh, i my dm style i'm i i like to improv a lot i like to have like a loose framework for what's going to happen in a couple of options but having this like what felt like a real ass place you know even in schematic was uh was so interesting to build philosophy and culture around that it it, uh, it it was it was it was it felt lived in by the time you guys got there which was really cool yeah it sure did i really enjoyed playing as a character in that as well being along for the ride <laughs> So uh, since Caleb has some limited time with us, I wanted to ask you, Caleb, what's your favorite mythology that, like, your favorite mythology that you have? Ooh. Um, I've been getting really into Vikings lately. Mm, so, nice. like, Viking mythology is really interesting. Um, I, I feel like a lot of my world-building ideas come from video games because i am a gamer <laughs> um so uh recently got assassin's creed valhalla nice and it is Ooh. awesome um but before that like i love shows like vikings and any like I, I i guess it's all stuff where like it's not actually in my imagination it's like <laughs> having it presented and be like oh this is really cool which i feel is is maybe slightly different than coming up with like your own ideas but i feel like i'm able to pull from that in certain you know aspects when playing maybe you know our D, &D games that we have or when thinking of you know creative things to do like i've started generating some ai art and recently it was like vikings battle and it created this really cool image so like not being an artist myself i really enjoy and appreciate when like any type of art form incorporates things that like interest me. So it's pretty cool. Well, I, I've got a, I've got a question when it comes down to that, because I've, I've officially been to two um, EDM concerts slash fest music festivals. And okay. one thing that I've, I've thought is really interesting about certain artists and you, you as a musician can probably speak to this is that there seems to be kind of a world building or a theme around like, the genre and the way people play their light and video shows to go along with their music. And I was curious um, in, in your experimentation with music, if that like factors in, like, do you, do you like try and manufacture that like synesthesia feeling where you're like, this soundscape is making me think of something like uh, something specific? Kind of. Um, I, I think it comes down more to like what you feel when you create certain sounds. And especially this is super prevalent in like EDM because you can literally just go in and play with different distortions and different plugins and things like that to create your own sound. And if you listen to like various EDM artists and when you get down into the subgenres, it's very much like when you hear a song, you're like, I know it's this artist because that's their sound. And when you hear that sound, it creates that feeling and emotion. And I feel like that's where, you know, when you're thinking of, okay, how will, how will the crowd react to this? Like most live DJing is just trying to understand how the crowd is reacting to different things. Like DJs will experiment with a ton of things and they learn at shows what the crowd reacts to. And then they may take that back to the studio and incorporate that into the sounds that they're creating. That's that cool. is metal as hell. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a pretty interesting process that, you know, you go through in that experimentation side of things. And that actually, like, it makes me think of a lot of things that I do. Like, um, I'm, uh, I'm an illustrator by trade. And like, a lot of times trying to work on a piece, that's a big thing that you try to uh, focus on is just trying to control the mood of what the viewer is going to see. And I imagine that's got to be like a pretty uh pretty similar to what you deal with djing we we talked about this before um the it's the gesture 
like no matter how the how the 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 work of art changes over the course from you know your initial sketchings to the finished piece what needs to be maintained is the gesture of the piece uh yeah. like like is it is it going for what you wanted it to go for in the end yeah do you find like when you're building up with uh with music does it kind of stick on that that same path where you you have like a mood or something that you're trying to go for for the uh piece I don't know, <laughs> song sound <laughs> whatever it may be yeah yeah absolutely like it's it's very much a form of expression like that's the simplest thing just as i'm sure in your art like it's a it's another form of expression of what you may be going through what feelings you may have you know what is inspiring you at that moment in time which i think you know the topic of this podcast world building like a lot of it does come down to your own interpretations of the world that you feel or that you're inspired by things like that well said well said <laughs> thanks i know for me i like to I just take different concepts or ideas and I try to place them in a world and then everything else is sort of a placeholder. And then as I need to define things, I'll build them up. And that kind of helps me then flesh out the world, which is why I like doing my world building through Dungeons and Dragons a lot because it prompts me to, okay, they're going to this city. I better think about what makes this city unique and different things. And it kind of births more creativity from necessity. So that's, that's kind of my style of it. Well, and can I ask you something about that and the way that Absolutely. you like to, to world build and, and go and jump off of that and feel free to shoot down this particular topic, but the Star Wars trading card game. Yes. And, he loves and playing your, this too. <laughs> yeah. So um, I remember you, I can't remember if you, I think you told me about this, like maybe a year into knowing you, where you told me about the story of how you got into the Star Wars trading card game and how you used it to storytell. Mm -hmm. And that was always something I thought was very fascinating and very unique to you. So could you oh, elaborate you. on that? Yes, well, I, I've uh, been honored enough to play this now ancient game with Caleb in the past, <laughs> um, because I used to play it on my own a lot. So it was fun to fun to have someone else to play with, but it's uh, for those audience members who don't know, the Star Wars, was it the Star Wars CCG, the Star Wars customizable card game from Decipher, which was big back in the 90s, is um, just a really well-built game for really at the end of it, it comes down to unit movement, interactions, and land control. And it's kind of like controlling resources to like, you know, uh, take away from your opponent is kind of the game, but I found that it's just really fun for world building around that. It was very much my precursor to Dungeons and Dragons, where I would make my own cards of all kinds of fictional things. I even made a card of Caleb and myself so we could play in the game. <laughs> um, nice. But uh, we, uh, yeah, I just made a ton of different cards and then I would play them out. And as the game unfolded, it would make a movie in my head. And it was, it was very much combat based. So there wasn't as much role-playing or storytelling which is why i relied on characters who had fictional backgrounds i was already invested in because they mm -hmm. kind of came with their own quirks and character building and arcs already implemented um mm -hmm. but yeah it, it very much formed my storytelling leading up to dungeons and dragons which i found is a much more expressive and open way of doing things but yeah the star wars customizable card game was my precursor to that for sure I can't believe we didn't lose you to Warhammer 40k at some point, <laughs> considering the way you talk about um, that card game. I, I can't get into the lore of Warhammer 40k. It's just, just something about it just doesn't appeal to me. I don't know what it is. I've tried. A lot of my friends are very into it. And uh, that was actually the first like role playing game I ever played was, um, oh, what's it called? Rogue Trader, which is a, a version of a. Uh, it takes place within it's kind of like space pirates which huh. sounds sounds awesome but it just i just can't get into the whole uh, just yeah it just doesn't appeal to me my friends are like textbooks when you ask them about warhammer 40k they will tell you everything and i'm just like eh, not that cool i don't know why i can't get into it i like the I, necrons I, they're cool i like their aesthetic 
I've met some very interesting people like that, that like you, like people in the army who were officers that you wouldn't expect. Like, this is like, this is how you unwind. Like you go do more. Oh, Caleb, oh, have a. Bye Caleb. We'll see you buddy. Thanks for talking you guys, about music. Sorry to interrupt. No, thanks bye. for coming oh, on. Go for it. See ya. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, anyway, so I, I, I met army officers that like, uh, like for me, it was like, well, this is how you unwind. And it would, uh, the, the guy I'm thinking of specifically was also a huge Game of Thrones fan. Nice. And his rationale behind it was like, you know, there, there's all these inter, interspace politics and everything that like you're seeing, he's, he, he kind of described it as like you're seeing the battle and you're playing the battle that is kind of this uh, pinpoint. It's the nice edge of all this stuff that's coming behind it in the lore. Hmm. And, and the fact that each army like adapted to a different play style to him was very fascinating. And I, um, I, I, I listened to an amazing podcast about uh, that ended up being about Dungeons and Dragons, actually, interestingly enough, um, not that they're going to need the, the bump, but on um, on uh, Pushkin Industries, there's a podcast called Cautionary Tales uh, okay. mm -hmm. by Tim Harford, who's an English economist, but he's a very interesting, like holistic economist. Huh. And he did a story about the the big 80s D&D &D flap, the Satanic Panic. Yeah. And he he actually drilled down on like the case of the kid that went missing that like a whole small town thought this kid had been sacrificed to Satan. And he rolled a nat one. What can I say, man? Right. Like, <laughs> I was like, sorry, dude. Well, and that's, that's what everybody thought. Everyone thought like, if you lost this game or whatever, you got, you got sacrificed or something, but like, it was actually Your character like dies. You must die in real life. You must, you yes. must die. It is the, it is the only way to be true to the character. It's very, <laughs> that's actually how Daniel Day Lewis would play D and D. And that's why he doesn't play D and D. Um, but like he, he, he rolled, he rolled back a bit to the, to the impetus of, Mm -hmm. of these tabletop RPGs and the role-playing aspects specifically because they were born out of the military exercise of troop management on a field where people would get together and they would have miniatures for like the Battle of Waterloo. Right. And, and they'd run through like alternate versions of how to do this battle. And then I want to say in the early 20th century or the middle of the 20th century, uh, one of these enthusiasts wrote in a mechanic for having diplomats and having hmm. and being able to role play like maybe we could make a treaty or like what would be going on behind the scenes. And that eventually became your first edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, probably not directly. I can't remember what steps were in between. Yeah. But that that became a we have a mechanic for combat, but there's also the mechanic for role-playing and uh it was a really interesting evolution that fed that human need for we want to we want to wrap our heads around how these historical battles or even these fantasy battles are working and now we want to more exist in the world in a way to get more in depth into how this is played yeah mm -hmm. i think it's a classic thing of escapism and entertainment that humans have been doing since humans started being humans i think you know absolutely yeah. will what are your thoughts on this and it's kind of interesting how that kind of like how the uh wargaming kind of just evolved to be a store a storytelling tool in uh, in a lot of ways, not just with D&D, &D, but with a lot of these tabletop role-playing games uh, that kind of found their way deriving from there. Um, and I think that's just kind of a, a almost human nature of trying to take whatever tools we have to try to just kind of tell these stories in, in different ways or live in these worlds, not just through escapism, but through actual uh gameplay and through uh collaborative uh effort yeah 
Yeah, yeah that's, that really appeals to the social aspect of D&D as well. Yeah, it's that different kind of social interaction where, um, I don't know about you guys, but one thing that I really like about being able to role play is I get to, I get to put on another character's personality and aspects. And, and there's the, um, there's the, what would this character do? And I, like, I feel the same way with, uh, writing and world building when it comes back down to it, um, to kind of, kind of, to kind of bring it around, um, the things that a character does is informed by the world and the culture around that character. And you can really see how intimately meshed all of that minutia can be um, going, going back and back and back to uh, whatever. And the cool thing about a fantasy universe is you get to base it in things that you know. Yeah. or things that you can conceptualize in order to make something like that. And the people that are really, really good at stuff like this, I'm, I'm specifically thinking of people that are very good at, at um, predictive sci-fi. Um, mm. They can take I got to plug The Expanse. I just watched the final two episodes last night. Very <laughs> predictive science fiction. Very good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by stuff like that because those are people that are able to take like not just what could happen in the future, but things that are historically close. I think it's one of the reasons that um, that Firefly hit as hard as it did for the one season that it did, yeah. because mm-hmm. it was there's all these planets that got newly ter- terraformed because Earth got used up. There's going to be a good chunk of the Earth that's all thrown in with this big alliance. That's basically everybody. But there's going to be a lot of these border planets that are kind of left to their own devices, and it's very much going to be raw pioneer day stuff. Yep. And and it 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 first of all it hit a tone because it was a space western and it was awesome, and you can't discount how great um, Zoe and Mal and everybody were in that show. Yeah. Um, but it's also like it felt it felt like a real possibility. In a lot of ways. Yeah. Which and, helps with the suspension of disbelief when you're like, oh, this could actually happen, something something similar to this. It's a lot easier to sit there and really be like, what are these characters going to do? Because you really, you can really identify with them, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's huge. That's so powerful. I think that's also something, um, and I'm sure everyone's sick of me talking about this show by now, but Arcane does really well um when it's i will never get sick of hearing you talk about arcane so please go on yeah but um that's something that they do really well with the two different uh the two different main areas of the uh of piltover and the undercity and i will try to avoid spoilers since it's not been out for more than two months now (laughs) Mm -hmm. um but the way that they develop just like the different uh, the different sceneries and uh, the different cultures that each different part of of these societies have uh, just really kind of ties into like the greater plot where there's almost a a story happening in the background just of uh, the scenery that changes over time and how you see uh, every one interacting not just with the main cast but all of the uh completely tertiary characters that are just living their life in the background um that really give you a feel for like where we are and what we're dealing with before any of the the main cast uh does anything to uh show us or tell us anything about these places Mm -hmm. that sounds like some solid world world building well, and it does such a good job um, to to glom onto this uh, of building building so much in the background without having to expressly say it. Um, it's the the and it's not just the visual storytelling and the aesthetic. It's the way different characters interact. It's the way they talk to each other. It's it's the it's the difference between one main character's bedroom compared to the 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 past living situation of another character it's 
it's the difference between leadership styles when there is a leadership changeover in the undercity. It is the whole thing is built around uh, the whole story is built around characters that feel like they live in this uh, in this world, and they don't have to. You don't have um, as much as I don't like bagging on movies. Yeah. You don't have the you don't have the issue with the frustratingly the frustratingly inept audience implant character. Um, don't elaborate it, more on that. What is, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with this trope. Okay, so I I, I know there's a trope for this, um, but the there is there is most of the time there is some form of audience insert character. It is a character that is not of the main situation that you can that their whole purpose is to be the dialogue sponge, the the exposition sponge. Um, Ice T is that in <laughs> in uh, um, Law and Law Order, Order, SVU. Law and Order, SVU, from what I understand, and and Will knows more about this than I do because I've, I've never seen Law and Order, but I do know that that Ice T, uh, aside from also being like like phenomenally intelligent, from what I understand, is like relegated to that character. Was like you're telling me this? That's crazy. Um, <laughs> throughout the episode but um there are times when it's very very frustrating because of the like the character feels completely useless in the wider mythology of a world the thing like the one that really bothered me personally was as much as i love shia labeouf and i don't want him to hunt me for sport um <laughs> the transformers movies Hmm. Shia LaBeouf's character, like it's not that he didn't Sam need to Witt be Wiki. there. Sam Witwicky, Sam Witwicky, like and but there were a lot of options for how that character could have been cool. I had my own little head cannon for how the second movie could recover from him being such a a limp noodle. <laughs> um, honestly, like 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 keeping most of the same plot of that second movie, whatever plot there was, I not not going to be. Um, but uh, for me, the, the problem was like, why do these robots feel the need to drag along Sam with Wiki? Like he is, he is frustrating in every sense of the way. And he, to go, to go to my tactical set sensibilities, he is a liability in every sense of the word. Now he was, he was theoretically important in the second movie where he was technically, I think he was like this repository of Cybertron information or something. That's right. But he... Did it freeze again? He, but at that point, I'm still frozen. I'm not frozen. You're I'm not frozen. frozen now. Okay, good. Uh, in the second movie, yeah. he didn't become an interesting character because of it. He became a MacGuffin. He became, mm. he became the, the incidentally useful thing in the plot. And in my head, the one way that could have fixed that is, all right, if he's this repository of energy and information from your home robot planet, let him have an Iron Man suit up moment where yeah. the motherfucker gets into a car and it turns into a mech around him. Like, yeah, oh, that would have been cool. Just, just do that. Also, and I would think of the toy sales. Think of the toy sales, yeah. yeah. And you and you've given every twelve year old that went to that movie to watch giant robots at robot explosions another reason to rewatch that movie because it's so awesome that you're telling me all I have to do is devour an alien cube and I too can be a mech pilot. That right. mm -hmm. that's that seems particularly really fun to me, and that and like yeah. I I I appreciate fun more than I do. Uh, like like a like an audience insert character is not a sin. They're pretty fucking essential in a lot of ways, but they have to be fun and they have to be relevant to the plot. And yes. Arcane really does that specifically by having two like sets of characters um, that are usually paired up that are all, that are almost consistently from completely different walks of life with completely different views that have to explain shit to each other. That is relevant to all of their lives. 
That's yeah. what I tried to do in my new story because I do have a character named Shorshaka who uh, kind of grows up in a temple um, of lunar magic and her temple is attacked and she's the sole survivor. So when she meets Mirabella, the character that Carrie created in the Wastelands, uh, a lot is explained to her about the outside world from Mirabella but I also made Shoshaka where she's not useless she has lunar magic you know she is kind of still getting her own confidence and stuff but she can dish out some damage and she kind of gets more confident as the story goes on so hopefully I'm avoiding that trope with my story yeah that, that's think, intensely cool I think that's actually just a really important thing is uh, there's when you're building a world there has to be a reason that people are are there or people are doing things. If everything is just awful all the time, no matter what, why is anybody there? Why are why are we here? Or like when you have, especially, uh, and this happens all the time in fiction, where you have a character that's just annoying for the sake of being annoying that nobody likes, and then you're just kind of there like, why are it why are they still part of the group how yeah. have you not just been left for dead in the desert somewhere mm-hmm. yeah and that's where it comes back to the integrity of the work of really thinking it through and saying okay in the world i've built what is this logical or not because again you can have all kinds of fantasy and magic and what ifs and all that but it's within the world you've created is what's happening logical because if it's not it's going to push the viewer out Mm -hmm. it has to be logical you know yeah because once you have that suspension of disbelief just trying to maintain that is like the most important thing for the story of making sure that your audience stays here with the characters and that they're willing to continue to come back uh chapter after chapter in your case or uh scene after scene or movie after movie or whatever medium you're you're going for Mm-hmm. And also, or, uh, or song after song, or whatever. Yeah. The other thing, though, is like when you are making those um, those characters of having that pie, not just for like to each other, but also uh, to the audience. Um, do you guys have uh, trouble like uh, developing that so that your actual reader feels something for these characters? Or how do you go mind about I, that, rather? Mind if I take this one, Josh? Um, go for it. Because this is something that's like uh, that that I've I've had to evolve with over the course of uh, writing writing the book I'm writing. Because when I first started writing the book, it was to interpret um, like it was basically a war memoir in a fantasy universe of of like uh, i'm going to create these analogous these analogous characters that um are that respond to you know people or situations or concepts in in what actually like happened to me and uh and it was an interesting exercise to translate like some modern events into a fantasy universe and what the world is around it um and then i completely basically erased that because what came out of it was uh like i had i had the i i had an interesting story idea after writing all this but i didn't have a spine for it i didn't have something that like drew the whole thing together and then i you know took a break from it i kept coming up with ideas and i kept kind of like world building in the back of my head i keep notes and then what spurred me on was um, I had a, I had a breakthrough in therapy and all of a sudden my brain went, I, I don't, I don't have to make this about the event. I, I want to write, I want to write a good story. And so I basically started rewriting the whole thing from the beginning. And part of that for me was what are these characters like in the context of the story and why are they the way that they are? Would they would they actually say these things? Like characters being cagey with one another is not because the plot tells them that they need to be cagey right now to keep information from a character or that they wouldn't say anything. A character not saying something is specifically because, um, in, in a lot of cases, because they are ashamed of it or they think that would put them in danger. 
Mm-hmm. And, and that, and so, so what I've been able to, to build off of that uh, was the started as like a, a bunch of analogous real people. And then they became more or less kind of archetypal in a couple different ways. And then the more that, that, that I wrote them, they went from archetypes to uh, people with divergent personalities, different experiences and different traumas that informed their reactions at any given time. And, and that's been, um, that's, that's helped me personally. And I, and I, I farm this stuff out to you guys a lot, specifically for the reason of when I rewrite a character to make them have a more emotional bent, or I change their lines, or I change what they're doing in any situation down to like their internal monologue and their like physical reactions. Um, That's the thing that I want to resonate with people and, and to feel like, even if they haven't experienced exactly the same thing, that this is uh, uh, applicable to their life. And I think you've done that, man, with everything you've shown me on the book you're writing, you've really done the work to build those characters like with the same depth as if you were giving as if there was someone who existed in the world that I didn't know who I needed to know intimately and you were like okay I know this person I'm going to transfer my knowing of this person to you which is a daunting task you have done that with those main characters and that's why the book is going to hit so hard that's why I think you've built up such a good thing um, and why it's going to resonate with the readers is because you've gone and done the work built the psychology of those characters and this is what really good actors talk about when they're bringing their characters to life they talk about delving into that psychology really getting to the roots of the character why are they doing these things what what matters to them what's the internal process going on in their minds and you've done that work so it's really exciting Thank you. It's uh, once once I get uh, once I finish rowing upstream past the second act chasm, uh, and I and I get into the the fun part of the third act, then yeah. then we'll I'm I'm excited to actually like like shoot off a draft. But um, yes, I that's can't wait to read it. really that's really interesting. That's 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 really like the the actor thing, like the like the like a good actors and like applying the psychology is a really interesting um, way of making that concept meet. Actually, yep. hmm. yeah. And actually, interestingly, I I kind of when I'm trying to build a character because I used to try to make comic books before I kind of gave up on that because I am a terrible writer. Um, one of the things I always like to do to try to get into the head of characters is just asking like these like seemingly arbitrary questions like, oh, what is this character's favorite color, or what do they like to eat, or whatever else just to try to like get into that headspace yeah just to give the character more depth and more you're just, it's like you're painting a picture you're adding new colors new mm-hmm. elements new items and just introducing it and it's fantastic well that's that's where i'll i'll disagree with will too um i think you're i think you're a, a really fantastic world builder and i think that really does apply to writing and while you you don't feel like you have a whole lot of con, con, uh, confidence in like your sentence structure or dialogue or anything the the questions that you ask about like what a character is like and that you've actually asked me in the past um have have totally changed my perspective on care like like you like you asked me what my main character's favorite food was Mm. and and i i i it it didn't even take a whole lot of of thinking it was just oh it'd be like this and or or like like it, it would be some like down home cooking kind of thing and what that informed was uh, a whole aspect of the character that I hadn't thought of, which was very cool to me. I can already see the webs. I'm like, why does he like home to, you know, home cooking? And it's like, oh, his tells you about his childhood. It was good. You know, you start building these, it's like roots from a tree just growing. Mm. Absolutely. I also think we've frozen Will. Um, oh, no. Apparently my question was so good that it, uh, it froze him in place. <laughs> Oh, oh I no, we lost him. That's I okay. Think, uh, we I got think... we got Caleb back though. We got Caleb back. How's yeah, your day going, meeting. Caleb? Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Uh, my day job is very close to um, going live, which is always fun. Ooh, exciting. 
Yeah. It's, um, it's pretty exciting. Nice. Cause I'll actually be able to do what I was hired to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's gotta be a, a weird limbo before it goes live where you're just kind of like, I'm here, I'm an expert, but you know, can't really do much right now. Yeah. Especially as a market, there's only so much strategy and planning you can do as a marketer before you have to like do the marketing. Right. Um, so I've been antsy for it to go live and, um, you know, hit the ground running with it. I mean, it's been an awesome few months building it for sure and getting everything ready. Um, but I'm ready for it to launch. <laughs> yeah, that's mm. exciting, man. Congrats. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, as soon as Will gets back, of course, um, I think this is a good place to uh, to go ahead and end this episode of uh, Nerds and Friends because I have to go get ready for a lovely work call for, for my job for producing Seeking Justice. Uh, we're going to go Excellent. ahead and do some scheduling work and work on our last... Uh, we're down to four days now. Four more days Ooh. of filming. We're, Four more days. Exciting. It's just trying to line up everyone's schedule is the worst. It is, yes. It's a, but uh, we got a great team, so we're going to make it get it done. So I can believe it. Will, sorry we lost you there for a second. All right. My power actually just went out. So, oh, oh, no. oh damn. Don't know. Yeah. Don't know what I missed, but I uh, had to just hop back on with the phone here. Had That's to go. Awesome. Had to go. Crank. Had to go. Crank the uh, the generator that you keep out on your balcony. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for a great podcast, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording, but thank you for another awesome episode of Nerds and Friends. Absolutely. Yeah.